Hello and welcome uh, to the first uh, keynote lecture session of the day uh, today on geometric deep learning, uh, the Erlangen program of machine learning. Our speaker for today is uh, Michael Bronstein, who is a professor at Imperial College London, where he holds the chair in machine learning and pattern recognition. And he's also the head of graph learning research at Twitter. Um, Michael received a PhD from Technion in 2007, and he has held um, several visiting appointments at Stanford, MIT, and Harvard. Um, he is uh, furthermore a fellow of the IEEE, IAPR, and ELIS, and um, he is a, a remarkable researcher. He has received uh, five URC grants, um, and he has um, funded multiple startup companies, so he's a very successful entrepreneur. He has served as principal engineer at, at Intel and has been one of the key developers of the Intel RealSense technology. In his lecture, Michael is gonna be telling us about uh, geometric deep learning, which is a field that he has pioneered. Um, he is one of the pioneers uh, of this, of this uh, topic. And uh, this is um, an attempt for geometric unification of a broad class of machine learning problems from the perspectives of symmetry and invariance. So I, I very much look forward to the presentation. After the talk, um, we will have the Q&A session with Michael. Um, please uh, post your questions in the rocket chat. We will collect them from there and then uh, read them to, to our speaker, uh, Michael. So please, let's get started. Hello, I'm Michael Bronstein. I'm a professor at Imperial College London and head of graph learning research at Twitter. I will talk about geometric deep learning. I guess you are all familiar with deep learning, so let me decipher the word geometric. And for this purpose, allow me to take you back in history. For almost 2000 years, the word geometry was synonymous with Euclidean geometry, simply because no other types of geometry existed. Euclid's monopoly came to an end in the 19th century when Lobachevsky, Boyai, Gauss, Riemann, and others constructed the first examples of non-Euclidean geometries. Together with the development of projective geometry, an entire zoo of different geometries emerged, with mathematicians debating which geometry is the true one and what actually defines a geometry. A way out of this pickle was shown by a young German mathematician Felix Klein, appointed in 1872 as a professor in the small Bavarian University of Erlangen. In a research paper that entered the history of mathematics as the Erlangen program, Klein proposed approaching geometry as the study of invariants or symmetries, the properties that remain unchanged under some class of transformations. This approach created clarity by showing that different geometries could be defined by an appropriate choice of symmetry transformations formalized using the language of group theory. The impact of the Erlangen program on geometry and mathematics in general was very profound. It also spilled into other fields, especially physics, where symmetry considerations allowed to derive conservation laws from the first principles, an astonishing result known as Noether's theorem. It took several decades until this fundamental principle for the notion of gauge invariance in its generalized form developed by Young and Mills in 1954 proved successful in unifying all the fundamental forces of nature with the exception of gravity. This is what is called the standard model and it describes all the physics we currently know. I can only repeat the words of a Nobel winning physicist, Philip Anderson, that it's only slightly overstating the case to say that physics is the study of symmetry. You may wonder at this point, what does it all have to do with deep learning? I believe that the current state of affairs in the field of deep learning reminds a lot the situation in geometry in the 19th century. On the one hand, in the past decade, deep learning has brought a revolution in data science and made possible many tasks previously thought to be beyond reach. On the other hand, we now have a zoo of different neural network architectures for different types of data, but few unifying principles. As a consequence, it is difficult to understand the relations between different methods, which inevitably leads to the reinvention and rebranding of the same concepts. So we need some form of geometric unification in the spirit of the Erlangen program that I call geometric deep learning. It serves two purposes. First, to provide a common mathematical framework to derive the most successful neural network architectures. And second, to give a constructive procedure to build future architectures in a principled way. 
the term itself, geometric deep learning, I made it up for my ERC grant in 2015, and it became popular after a paper we wrote for the IEEE signal processing magazine. Geometric deep learning is now used almost synonymously with graph neural networks, but I hope to show you that it's part of a much broader picture. If we look at machine learning, at least in its simplest setting, it's essentially a function estimation problem. We are given the outputs of some unknown function on a training set, let's say label dog and cat images, and try to find a function from some hypothesis class that fits well the training data and allows to predict the outputs on previously unseen inputs. What happened in the past decade is that the availability of large high-quality data sets such as ImageNet coincided with growing computational resources, GPUs, allowing to design rich function classes that have the capacity to interpolate such large datasets. Neural networks appear to be a suitable choice to represent functions because even with the simplest construction, like the perceptron shown here, we can produce a dense class of functions using just two layers, which allows us to approximate any continuous function to any desired accuracy. We call this property universal approximation. The setting of this problem in low dimensions is a classical problem in approximation theory that has been studied to death in the past century. We have very precise mathematical control of the estimation errors. But the situation is entirely different in high dimensions. We can quickly see that in order to approximate even a simple class of, let's say, Lipschitz continuous functions, like an example shown here, a superposition of Gaussian blobs put in the quadrants of a unit cube, the number of samples grows very fast with the dimension. It is in fact exponential, so we get a phenomenon colloquially known as the curse of dimensionality. And since modern machine learning methods need to deal with data in thousands or even millions of dimensions, the curse of dimensionality is always there, making such a naive approach to learning impossible. This is perhaps best seen in computer vision problems like image classification. Even tiny images tend to be very high dimensional, but intuitively they have a lot of structure that is broken and thrown away when we parse the image into a vector to feed it into the simple perceptron neural network. If the image is now shifted by just one pixel, the vectorized input will be very different, and the neural network will need to be shown a lot of examples in order to learn that shifted inputs must be classified in the same way. The remedy for this problem in computer vision came from the classical works in neuroscience by Hubel and Wiesel, the winners of the Nobel Prize in Medicine for the study of the visual cortex. They showed that brain neurons are organized into local receptive fields, which served an inspiration for a new class of neural architectures with local shared weights. First the neocognitron of Fukushima and then the convolutional neural networks, the seminal work of Jan Lekan, where weight sharing across the image effectively solved the curse of dimensionality. Let me now show another example. What you see here is my favorite molecule of caffeine represented as a graph. The nodes here are atoms and edges are chemical bonds. If we were to apply a neural network to this input, for example, to predict some chemical property, like its binding energy to some receptor, we could again parse it into a vector. But this time you see that any arrangement of the node features will do because in graphs, unlike images, we don't have a preferential way of ordering the nodes. And molecules appear to be just one example of data with irregular non-Euclidean structure on which we would like to apply deep learning techniques. Social networks are another prominent example. These are gigantic graphs with hundreds of millions of nodes. We also have interaction networks or interactomes in biological sciences, manifolds and meshes in computer graphics, and so on. All these are examples of data waiting to be dealt with in a principled way. So let's look again at the multidimensional image classification example that at the first glance seemed hopeless because of the curse of dimensionality. Fortunately, we have additional structure that comes from the geometry of the input signal. We call this structure a geometric prior, and it's a general powerful principle that gives us optimism and hope in dimensionality-cursed problems. In our example of image classification, the input image is not just a d-dimensional vector. It's a signal defined on some domain, which in this case is a two-dimensional grid. The structure of the domain is captured by a symmetry group, the group of 2D translations in our example, which acts on the points on the domain. In the space of signals, the group actions on the underlying domain are manifested through what is called the group representation. In our case, it's simply the shift operator, a D by D matrix that acts on the D-dimensional vector. 
this geometric structure of the domain underlying the input signal imposes structure on the class of functions f we are trying to learn. We can have functions that are unaffected by the action of the group, what we call invariant functions, and a good example is the image classification problem. No matter where the cat is located in the image, we still want to say it's a cat. So this is an example of shift invariance. On the other hand, we can have a case where the function has the same input and output structure. For example, image segmentation where the output is a pixel-wise label mask. We want the output to be transformed in the same way as the input, or what we call an equivariant function. And again, in this example, what we see is shift equivariance. Another type of geometric power is called scale separation. In some cases, we can construct a multi-scale hierarchy of domains by assimilating nearby points and producing also a hierarchy of signal spaces that are related by a coarse graining operator P. On these coarse scales, we can apply coarse scaled functions. We say that our function F is locally stable if it can be approximated as the composition of the coarse graining operator P and the coarse scale function F prime. While the original function f might depend on long-range interactions on the domain, in locally stable functions it is possible to separate the interactions across scales by first focusing on localized interactions and then propagating them towards the coarse scales. These two principles give us a general blueprint of geometric deep learning that we can recognize in the majority of popular deep neural architectures. We can apply a sequence of equivariant layers and then an invariant global pooling layer aggregating everything to a single output. And in some cases, we can also create a hierarchy of domains by some coarsening procedure that takes the form of local pooling in neural network implementations. This is a very general design that can be applied to different types of geometric structures, such as grids, homogeneous spaces with global transformation groups, graphs, and manifolds, where we have global isometry invariants as well as local gauge symmetries. We call these the 5G of geometric deep learning. The implementation of these principles leads to some of the most popular architectures that exist today in deep learning, such as convolutional networks emerging from translational symmetry, graph neural networks, deep sets and transformers implementing permutation invariants, and intrinsic mesh CNNs used in computer graphics and vision that can be derived from gauge symmetries. I hope to show you that these methods are also very practical and allow to address some of the biggest challenges from understanding the biochemistry of proteins and drug discovery to detecting fake news. Let me start with graphs. Probably each of us has a different mental picture when we hear the word graph, but for me, maybe because of my work at Twitter, I first think of a social network that models relations and interactions between users. Mathematically, the users of a social network are modeled as nodes of the graph, and their relations are edges or pairs of nodes, which can be ordered, in this case we call the graph directed, or unordered, in this case the graph is undirected. The nodes can also have some features attached to them, modeled as d-dimensional vectors, say the age, gender, or birthplace of social network users in our example. A key structural characteristic of a graph is that we don't have a canonical way to order its nodes. So if we arrange the node feature vectors into a matrix, we automatically prescribe some arbitrary ordering of the nodes. The same holds for the adjacency matrix that represents the structure of the graph. If we number the nodes differently, the rows of the feature matrix and the corresponding rows and columns of the adjacency matrix will be permuted by some permutation matrix P. P is a representation of the permutation group and we have n factorial such elements. If we want to implement a function on the graph that provides a single output for the whole graph, like predicting energy in our molecular graph example, we need to make sure that its output is unaffected by the ordering of the input nodes. We call such F permutation invariant. If, on the other hand, we want to make node-wise predictions, for example, to detect malicious users in a social network, we want a function that changes in the same way as the input with the reordering of the nodes, or in other words, is permutation equivariant. A way of constructing a pretty broad class of tractable functions on graphs is using the local neighborhood of a node. We look at the nodes that are connected by an edge to a node i and aggregate their feature vectors together with the feature vector of the node i itself. Because we don't have a canonical ordering of the neighbors, this must be done in a permutation invariant way. So this local aggregation function that I denote by phi must be permutation invariant. When we apply this phi at every node of the graph and stack the results into a feature matrix, we get a permutation equivariant function f. The way how the local function phi is constructed is crucial and its choice determines the expressive power of the resulting architecture. 
when phi is injective, it can be shown that the neural network designed in this way is equivalent to the Weisferer-Lehmann graph isomorphism test. It's a classical algorithm in graph theory that tries to determine if two graphs are isomorphic. We say that two graphs are isomorphic if there exists an age-preserving bijection between them, which can be represented by a permutation matrix that rearranges their adjacency matrices such that they are equal. The Weisferer-Lehmann algorithm is an iterative color refinement procedure that starts with all the nodes of the graph having the same color and then applies an injective function to the neighbor colors. This function has exactly the same structure as the local aggregation phi we defined before, and because it's injective, it produces distinct colors for differently structured neighborhoods. In this example, we have nodes with three blue neighbors that become yellow, and nodes with two blue neighbors that become green. This procedure is applied once again, and now we have three types of neighborhoods. Yellow, 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 green, green, and yellow, green, that are mapped into violet, red, and gray. If we try to refine the colors further, and they don't change anymore, the algorithm stops and outputs a histogram of colors. If another graph has a different histogram of colors, we can say for sure it's not isomorphic. But if we get two equal histograms, we actually don't know. The graphs might be isomorphic, so it is a necessary but insufficient condition. In fact, there are examples of graphs that are deemed equivalent by the weisferrer lehmann test, but they are not isomorphic, like the example shown here. The graph on the right has triangles, while the graph on the left doesn't and it can be shown that this test cannot count triangles in graphs. So here is a typical way the local aggregation function looks like in graph neural networks. We have a permutation invariant aggregation operator, such as sum or maximum, a learnable function psi that transforms the neighbor features, and another function phi that updates the features of node i using the aggregated features of its neighbors. There are lots of nuances on how to design each of these components, and this is a very active research topic in deep learning on graphs, but fortunately, most architectures fall into one of the following three flavors. The first flavor is convolutional. This is how some of the early works on graph neural networks looked like, originating from spectral analysis on graphs. In this setting, we aggregate neighbor features weighted by some fixed coefficients, Cij, that depend only on the structure of the graph, and can be interpreted as the importance of node j to the representation of node i. We will see that on grids, this scheme boils down to the classical convolution. The second flavor is based on attention, when the aggregation coefficients now depend on the features themselves. And in the most general flavor, we have a nonlinear function dependent on both feature vectors of node i and j, whose output can be regarded as a message that is sent to update the features of node i. Graph neural networks of this type are called message passing. In chemistry applications, they were introduced by Justin Gilmer from DeepMind, and in computer graphics in our collaboration with Yu Wang and Justin Solomon from MIT. If you look at a typical graph neural network architecture, you will immediately recognize an instance of our geometric deep learning blueprint with the permutation group as the geometric prior. We have a sequence of permutation equivariant layers, often referred to as propagation or diffusion layers in the literature, and an optional global pooling layer to produce a single graph-wise output. Some architectures also include local pooling layers obtained using some form of graph coarsening that can also be learnable. Let me say a few words about some interesting special cases of graph neural networks. First, a graph with no edges is a set, and sets are also unordered. In this case, the most straightforward approach is to process each element in the set entirely independently by applying a shared function phi to their feature vectors. This translates into a permutation equivariant function over the set and is a special setting of graph neural network. This architecture is known as deep sets in deep learning or point net in computer graphics. As another extreme, instead of assuming that each element of a set acts on its own, we can assume that any two elements can interact. This translates into a complete or a fully connected graph. In this case, the convolutional flavor actually makes no sense because the aggregation will be over the set of all nodes, and thus the second argument of our function would be the same for all nodes. We can use an attention-based aggregation, which we can interpret as a form of learnable soft adjacency matrix, and I hope you can recognize the famous transformer architecture that is now very popular in natural language processing applications, and it is also a particular case of a graph neural network. I should say that transformers are commonly used to analyze sequences of text where the order of nodes is given. This node information is typically provided in the form of what is called positional encoding, an additional feature that uniquely identifies the nodes. Similar approaches exist for general graphs, and there are several ways we can encode the node positions, we showed one such way in a recent paper with my students 
Georgos Boritsas and Fabrizio Frasca, where we counted small graph substructures such as triangles or clicks, providing this way a kind of structural encoding that allows the message passing mechanism to adapt to different neighborhoods. This architecture that we call graph substruction networks can be made strictly more powerful than the vice versa Lehman test by appropriate choice of substructures. It is also a way to incorporate problem-specific inductive bias. For example, in molecular graphs, cycles are prominent structures. In organic chemistry, we have an abundance of what is called aromatic rings. And here again, you can see the caffeine molecule that has a six and a five cycle. What we observe in experiments with this architecture is that our ability to predict chemical properties of molecules improves dramatically if we count rings of size five or more. So you can see that even in the cases where the graph is not given as input, graph neural networks still make sense. Even when the graph is given, we don't necessarily need to stick to it in order to do message passing. And in fact, a lot of recent approaches decouple the computational graph from the input graph. It can take the form of graph sampling, usually to address scalability issues, rewiring the graph, or using larger multi-hop filters where aggregation is performed also on the neighbors of the neighbors. Like in a recent work we did at Twitter, which we call SIGN, scalable inception like GNNs. We can also learn the graph on which to run a graph neural network that can be optimized for the downstream task. I call this setting latent graph learning. We can make the construction of the graph differentiable and backpropagate through it, and this graph can also be updated between different layers of the neural network. This is what we call dynamic graph CNN, the first architecture to implement latent graph learning that we did with colleagues from MIT. Perhaps in historical perspective, latent graph learning can be related to methods called manifold learning or nonlinear dimensionality reduction. The key premise of manifold learning is that even though our data lives in a very high dimensional space, it has low intrinsic dimensionality. A metaphor for this situation is the Swiss roll surface. We can think of our data points as if they were sampled from a manifold. The structure of this manifold can be captured by a local graph that we can then embed into a low dimensional space where doing machine learning, such as clustering, is more convenient. The reason why manifold learning never really worked beyond data visualization is that all these three steps are separate. While it's clear, for example, that the construction of the graph in the first step hugely affects the downstream task. With latent graph learning, we can bring new life to these algorithms. I call it manifold learning 2.0. We now have a way to build an end-to-end -end pipeline in which we build both the graph and filters operating on this graph as a graph neural network with latent graph structure. Let me now move to another type of geometric structures we are all familiar with and perhaps show you a different perspective. Grids are also a particular case of graphs and a grid with periodic boundary conditions that I show here is what is called a ring graph. Compared to general graphs, the first thing to notice on a grid is that it has a fixed neighborhood structure. Not only that, the order of the neighbors is fixed. I remind you that on graphs, we were forced to use a permutation invariant local aggregation function phi because we didn't have a canonical ordering of the neighbors. On the grid, we do. We can always put the green first, then the red, and then the blue. If we choose a linear function with the sum aggregation operation, we get the classical convolution, which if we write it as a matrix, has a very special structure called a circulant matrix. A circulant matrix is formed by shifted copies of a single vector of parameters theta, these are exactly the shared weights in CNNs. Circulant matrices are very special. They commute. And in particular, they commute with a special circulant matrix that cyclically shifts the elements of a vector by one position. We call it the shift operator. So circulant matrices commute with shift, which is just another way of saying that convolution is a shift equivariant operation. Now, this statement works in both directions. Not only every circulant matrix commutes with shift, but also every matrix that commutes with shift is circulant. So what we get is that convolution is the only linear operation that is shift equivariant. And you can see here the power of our geometric approach. Convolution automatically emerges from translational symmetry. I don't know how about you, but when I studied signal processing, nobody really explained where convolution comes from. It was just given as a formula completely out of the blue. Let me show you another nice thing. We know from linear algebra that commuting matrices are jointly diagonalizable, or there exists a common basis in which all convolutions amount to pointwise products. They become diagonal matrices. Since all circulant matrices commute, we can pick up one of them for the convenience of analysis, and it's easy to look at the eigenvectors of the shift. We can show that the eigenvectors of the shift operator are the discrete Fourier basis, or the DFT, 
So all convolutions are diagonalized by the Fourier transform. The eigenvalues are actually given by the Fourier transform of the vector of parameters theta that forms the convolution. So you can see that even the Fourier transform also comes from the fundamental principle of symmetry. This relation between the convolution and the Fourier transform is called the convolution theorem in signal processing, and it gives us two ways to perform convolution. Either by multiplying by a circuit matrix, this corresponds to sliding a filter along our signal, or in the Fourier domain as element-wise product of the Fourier transforms of the signal and the filter. Let me now describe a more general case where our group formalism will be more prominent. We can think of convolution as a kind of pattern matching operation. In an image, this is done by sliding a window across the plane. Let me write it a bit more formally. We need to define a shift operator T that will shift the filter, which I denote here by Psi, and an inner product that matches the filter to the image X. If we do it for every shift, we get the convolution. The special thing here is that the translation group can actually be identified with the domain itself. Each element of the group, a shift, can be represented as a point on the domain. This is not the general case, and in general we'll have the filter transformed by the representation of the group, rho, and the convolution will now have values for every element of the group, g. Here is an example of how to do convolution on the sphere, and it's not some exotic construction. Spherical signals are pretty important, for example, in astrophysics, where a lot of observational data is naturally represented on the sphere, like the cosmic microwave background radiation that I show here. Our group here is the special orthogonal group, SO3, of rotations that preserve orientation. And its action on points on the sphere can be represented by an orthogonal matrix R that has determinant equal to 1. So the convolution is defined on SO3. We get a value of inner product for every rotation R of the filter. If we want to apply another layer of such convolution, we need to apply it on the SO3 group. It's a three-dimensional manifold on which points are rotations themselves. I denote them by Q. The sphere in this example is a non-Euclidean space, a manifold, but it is quite special. Every point on the sphere can be transformed into another point by an element of the symmetry group of rotations. So in a sense, there is complete democracy among the points. In geometry, we call such spaces homogeneous, and their key feature is a global symmetry structure. This global symmetry structure doesn't obviously hold for general manifolds. One thing that we know when we apply a sliding window on an image is that it doesn't matter which way we go from one point to another. We'll always arrive at the same result. The situation is dramatically different on a manifold. If we go along the green path or the blue path, we'll arrive at a different result. In differential geometry, we call it parallel transport, and the result of moving a vector on a manifold is path-dependent. A crucial difference between manifolds and Euclidean spaces is that manifolds are only locally Euclidean. We can map a small neighborhood of a point U to what is called the tangent space. The tangent spaces can be equipped with additional inner product structure that is called the Riemannian metric. It allows us to measure lengths and angles. If the manifold is deformed without affecting the metric, we say it's an isometric deformation. And isometries also form a group. So we can define an analogy of convolution on manifolds using a local filter applied in the tangent space. And if we make this construction intrinsic or express entirely in terms of the metric, we get deformation invariance, or invariance with respect to the isometry group of the manifold. This was, in fact, the very first architecture for deep learning on manifolds that we called geodesic CNNs. One important thing I didn't say is that because we are forced to work locally on the manifold, we don't have a global system of coordinates. We need to fix a local frame at each point, or a gauge, how physicists call it. The gauge can be changed arbitrarily at every point by applying a gauge transformation typically a local orientation-preserving rotation. And we need to account for the effect of the gauge transformation on the filter by making it transform in the same way, such that the filter is gauge equivariant. What you can see here is, again, the comeback of our geometric deep learning blueprint, either in the form of invariance to the isometry group or equivariance to what is called the structure group of the tangent bundle of the manifold. The reason why we care about manifolds is that in computer vision and graphics, two-dimensional manifolds, or discrete surfaces, meshes, are a standard way of modeling 3D objects. What we gain from our geometric perspective is filters that can be defined intrinsically on the object, and this equips our deep learning architecture with invariance under inelastic deformations.
One application where dealing with deformable objects is crucial is motion capture or mock-up that is used in the production of expensive blockbuster movies. What you see here is a cheap markerless motion capture setup from a Swiss company called FaceShift. The company was bought by Apple in 2015 and its technology now powers the Animoji feature on the iPhone. Ten years ago, one would need a 3D sensor to produce this motion capture effect and I myself was very adamant about it. Since there were no cheap real-time sensors with sufficient resolution on the market at that time, we had to build one. This was our startup in Vision, and here you can see a Eureka moment from 2011 where an FPGA implementation of our sensor prototype worked for the first time. InVision was acquired by Intel in 2012, where I spent the following eight years building what is now called the RealSense technology. RealSense was released in 2014 with this funny commercial featuring Sheldon Cooper from The Big Bang Theory, and I'm sorry that I always forget his real name, and it was the first mass-manufactured integrated 3D sensor that became a commercial success for Intel. Fast forward 10 years, and we don't need 3D input anymore for something similar to that motion capture video that I showed. We can actually have hybrid geometric deep learning architectures for 3D shape synthesis problems with a standard 2D CNN encoder that works on the input image or video and a geometric decoder that reconstructs a 3D shape. This was the work of my PhD student, Dominic Colon, and last year at CVPR we showed a demo of full-body 3D avatars with detailed hands from purely 2D video input that ran on an old iPhone 10 times faster than real time. This was a collaboration with a startup Ariel AI that was acquired by Snap last year. Let me now talk about some applications of geometric deep learning, which is probably the part I am mostly excited about in this field. If we look at graphs, they are really ubiquitous. We can describe practically any system of relations or interactions as a graph, from nanoscales as models of individual molecules, to microscales looking at interactions between different molecules in our body, all the way to the macroscale, at which we can model social networks of whole countries or even the entire world. One thing that you often hear in the popular press in relation to social networks is the problem of misinformation or so-called fake news. There is empirical evidence that fake news spread differently on the social network and using graph learning we try to detect misinformation by looking at the spreading patterns of different stories. We got quite encouraging results and together with my students I founded a company called Fabula AI that commercialized this technology. In 2019 Fabula was bought by Twitter where I currently had a group that does research on GraphML. And as you can imagine graphs of different types such as the follow graph or the engagement graph are among the key data assets for Twitter. But if you ask me to pick just one application where I believe geometric deep learning is likely to produce the biggest impact, I think it's biological sciences and drug design. You may know that making new drugs is a very long and extremely expensive business. Bringing a new drug to the market takes more than a decade and costs more than a billion dollars. One of the reasons is the cost of testing where many drugs fail at different stages. The space of possible drug-like molecules that can be chemically synthesized is extremely large, while on the other hand, we can test maybe just a few thousands of compounds in the lab or in the clinic. So there is a huge gap that has to be bridged, and it can be done by computational methods that perform virtual screening of the candidate molecules, predicting properties such as toxicity and target binding affinity. Graph neural networks have recently achieved remarkable success in virtual screening of drugs. Nowadays, they are already more accurate and orders of magnitude faster than traditional approaches. Last year, the group of Jim Collins at MIT used graph neural networks to predict antibiotic activity of different molecules, leading to the discovery of a new powerful antibiotic compound called halicin that originated as a candidate anti-diabetic drug. If we look at traditional small molecule drugs, one thing that characterizes them is that drugs are typically designed to attach to, or as chemists say, bind some pocket-like regions on the surface of a target molecule, which is usually a protein. Here you can see again my favorite molecule, caffeine. When I drink from this cup, it will get into my bloodstream, cross the blood-brain barrier, and attach itself to the adenosine receptor in the brain. Its interface is cut out in this figure, so you can clearly see the deep pocket on the protein surface. More recently, the pharma industry is interested in drugs that disrupt or inhibit protein-to-protein -protein interactions, or PPIs, 
because most biochemical processes in our body, including those that are related to diseases, involve proteins that interact with each other. One of the most famous such mechanisms is the program death protein complex. It is used in cancer immunotherapy for which the Nobel Prize in Medicine was awarded in 2018. Since PPIs typically have flat interfaces like the program death ligand PDL1 protein I show here, they are usually considered undruggable by traditional small molecules. A promising new class of drugs is based on large biomolecules, peptides, proteins or antibodies that are engineered to address difficult targets. These drugs are called biologics and there are already several of them on the market. With my collaborators from EPFL, we developed a geometric deep learning architecture called Massif. It was on the cover of Nature Methods last year that allowed to design from scratch new protein binders. You can see three such examples that were experimentally confirmed to bind the PDL1 oncological target. Another promising direction towards cheaper and faster development of therapies is drug repositioning, when existing approved drugs are used against new targets, sometimes in combinations with other drugs. This is called combinatorial therapy or polypharmacy. Many such drug combinations may have unknown, potentially dangerous side effects, and graph neural networks were recently applied to predict them. These ideas are actually not limited to synthetic drugs. With collaborators from Imperial College and Vodafone Foundation, we took graph-based drug repositioning approaches to the domain of food. You may know that plant-based food ingredients are rich in compounds belonging to the same chemical classes as anti-cancer drugs. With every bite of food, we put thousands of bioactive molecules into our body. Most of them still remain largely unexplored by experts, not tracked by regulators and unknown to the public at large. How many of you have heard, for example, about polyphenols, flavonoids, or indoles? So it's truly the dark matter of nutrition. The way we model the effect of molecules is by how they interact with protein targets. Since proteins interact with each other, the effect on one target ripples through the PPI graph and affects other proteins, a kind of network effect because in our body's biochemistry, a lot of the biomolecules are interrelated. If we now take a training set, for example, of drugs with known anti-cancer effect, we can train a classifier based on a graph neural network that predicts how likely a molecule is to be similar to an anti-cancer drug from the way it interacts with protein targets. We can then apply this classifier to other molecules contained in food for which we know the interactions with proteins. And this gives us a list of potential anti-cancer food molecules. Now I'm hugely simplifying here. The biggest part of this work that appeared in Nature Scientific Reports was actually to study the pathways affected by these molecules and to confirm their anti-cancer effect and lack of toxicity. But to make long story short, we constructed the anti-cancer molecular profiles of over 250 different food ingredients, and we see that there are prominent champions that we call hyperfoods, for example, tea, cabbage, celery, and sage. These are all rather common, cheap, and I dare say boring ingredients that we better add to our diet. Perhaps the coolest part of this project is that the ingredients we identified were used by the famous chef Bruno Barbieri to present short recipes for Christmas. If you wonder why he is in bed, this was part of the Vodafone Foundation citizen science campaign called Dream Lab. We collaborated with them to use the idle power of smartphones at night to make our computations. It's a good moment to end on this tasty note. So let me conclude. We started with this somewhat irreverent desire to imitate the Erlangen program in machine learning, trying to derive different deep learning architectures from fundamental principles of symmetry. This took us all the way from image classification to molecular gastronomy. All the approaches we've seen were instances of a common blueprint of geometric deep learning where the architecture emerged from the assumptions on the domain underlying our data and its symmetry group. In the past few years, geometric deep learning methods, especially graph neural networks, have exploded, leading to several success stories in industrial applications. And I think it's quite indicative that last year, two major biological journals featured geometric deep learning papers on their cover, which means that it has already become mainstream and possibly will lead to new exciting results in fundamental sciences. Last but not least, I would like to acknowledge all my amazing collaborators and thank you for your attention.
Uh, all right, so welcome back everyone. Uh, my name is Guido Montufar. I'm very excited to be moderating this Q&A session with our keynote uh, speaker, Michael Bronstein. Um, please uh, keep your questions coming via the rocket chat. We will collect them uh, here and, and read them uh, to Michael. So Michael, very amazing presentation. A lot of people in the chat have mentioned that uh, this uh, truly impressive uh, graphics and visualization that you have done, very sweet into the topic, um, I believe. Uh, so maybe now at the Q&A uh, session, we can, we have a couple of topics, maybe from, I mean, you know, starts maybe from a general perspective. And one of the questions that has come up here by uh, Sanun Nanujial, um, he asks, um, to use Euclidean distance, the input set should be linear. So my question is in the case that the input set is non-linear, what's the method distance you should use? Yeah, so I'm not sure that I, I completely understand the question, but probably uh, in the more general case, we cannot really talk about uh, uh, linearity of the uh, of the input structure because it's not a vector space. So probably the, the, the most uh, correct uh, structure to think of is what is called a vector bundle, which is um, a generalization of a Cartesian product. So you have some base space and you have some uh, vector spaces that are attached at uh, each point of this space. And the structure of the base space and the, and the, the, the fibers of the bundle uh, can be different. So probably a good example is an RGB image. So that's what we give in our book. So the base space is a plane, it's two dimensional and uh, it has its own uh, symmetry structure such as translation group, but the fibers themselves are three dimensional vectors. And there, the, the, for example, the structure may be, I don't know, uh, permutation where you, uh, you can completely arbitrarily swap at each point the, uh, the color channels. So uh, the distance that you use on the base space and the distance that you use on the uh, fibers themselves can be completely different. I, I think this touches on a, on a question that I believe many people are interested in. Um, and so this, this came up um, during your talk uh, to some extent, but uh, it seems that you know, we have uh, data with many different uh, modalities and uh, that can look quite different. And, uh, is, is, is a very fundamental question. What is the natural geometry of that data? Is that, is that something that we construct based on our abilities or is there something inherent uh, to that data that you know, we could uh, go ahead and discover? And, and if so, what would be a way of doing that? And so you, you talk about invariances and equivariances, um, but it seems that some of these things uh, uh, even have names some theorems you know, that tell us you know, what are the right operations to look at. Um, so is, is there a hope that we can actually get a, you know, a unified manner to, to approach these things? Yeah, it's a good question. So uh, in my opinion, uh, in many cases, uh, the, the, the symmetry is natural. In uh, other cases, it's application dependent. So it's probably the, the later is more correct. And uh, even if you think of images, right? So if, uh, let's say, I want to classify cats and dogs or, or traffic signs, probably the thing that I would be interested in is uh, translation symmetry, maybe rotation symmetry. If I'm looking at, for example, at uh, pathological uh, uh, slices that I put under the microscope, so maybe reflection symmetry is also interesting because I can flip the, 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 the slide uh, under the microscope. So it's, it's really application dependent. Mm, okay, makes sense. So that brings me to a question that um, was um, posed here uh, by, Masanobu Hori, and um, he asks, how can we restrict the space of generative functions from vectors to geometric graphs, considering symmetries, if possible? It could be an inverse of the global pooling, but I believe the global pooling is non-invertible, so it seems still posed. I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, so how can we restrict the space of generative functions from vectors? Uh, to geometric graphs. So probably the question uh, uh, concerns um, the, the, some decoder architectures, right? So we have, for example, we can encode the graph into a vector in some latent space, and then uh, uh, we want to build the graph from it. So I don't think that, that there is a, an immediate recipe. So there are multiple ways that, that the graph can be constructed uh, from such representations. Uh, um, usually it's some kind of incremental construction. Uh, uh, in many cases, you actually have more structure than just nodes and edges. So if you think of molecules, which is one of the kind of shiny applications of uh, for graph neural networks, uh, chemists don't think of molecules as nodes and edges, right? Or atoms and bonds, they think of them as chemical structures or even reactions. So typically these graphs are constructed uh, by combining uh, smaller building blocks like 
cycles or uh, special chemical groups into uh, a bigger thing. So one of the, the, the popular approaches is what is called junction tree variation of the oils and colors, or the same approach that was used uh, for the discovery of halicin in the MIT paper. Mm -hmm. So maybe again in relation to you know the importance uh, of the geometry and how we actually go and try to to exploit it. Um, so there is a question here by Hannes Sterk, who asks, um, "What is your argument for the importance of scale separation and locality? Any attention mechanisms aggregate globally and have no locality? We learn positional encodings, but they still show impressive results." Yeah, so it's, uh, I think it's a good point. And in fact, well, uh, recently there are some results that show that the transformers uh, can uh, measure or even outperform convolutional neural networks uh, in cases where basically they have uh, the, 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 the symmetry that is hardwired into the architecture. Here, basically, they learn this symmetry from, from the data. So uh, I, I should say that uh, not in every problem we have uh, scale separation. So it requires some extra structure. So it requires uh, the possibility to define a metric on, on your domain that will assimilate uh, basically nearby points in the sense of this metric. Uh, I would argue that uh, probably first and foremost, it's a computational complexity uh, uh, trade-off. By uh, working at uh, different scales, you can use uh, smaller filters, right? Less uh, coefficients. Of course, you can have a gigantic filter that uh, uh, basically, or attention that, that uh, on the entire domain, but probably it requires uh, more parameters and more data. And uh, it might not be possible in uh, every situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so we have a lot of interest and, and questions that pertain, you know, the type of, uh, of relationships between this, this line of work and, and, and other topics. Of course, geometry is, uh, you know, it's a subject that appears in many, in many areas and, and in many contexts. Um, so in particular, we have here a question by Gustav Surek, who asks, uh, uh, do you find any connections of the geometric deep learning paradigm to some prior work in the statistical relational learning community? Uh, for example, lifted graphical models, such as Markov logic networks, uh, also exploiting symmetries in a principal manner, uh, but mostly these um, are outside the geometric interpretation, mostly in logic, um, which are also used to address relational data, such as molecules. Yeah, it's, it's an excellent uh, comment, and I think, well, uh, I'm not familiar with this uh, particular domain, so uh, it's hard for me to comment, but I would not be surprised if uh, certain, in some sense, some notions of symmetries exist in many other things. Uh, I think symmetry, if you think of it, is really one of the probably the most important principles that permeate science and engineering and, and physics and uh, mathematics. So uh, it is everywhere, and uh, it's probably one of the, the the fundamental principles of, of universe. Uh, um, so there are a lot of relations that, that we may maybe are unaware of or we have neglected or omitted in, uh, in our discussion. I will be uh, more than happy to, to hear about them. Yeah, that sounds very nice. Um, so maybe coming back to this um, and also you know connections with other subjects, uh, maybe one question that I, I believe is of interest to, to many of the participants is you know, what type of mathematics uh, do you consider most important here? It seems that in the context of graphs, uh, there is something like a discrete uh, type of relationships happening. But of course, there is also a differential geometry and you know in topics like information geometry, maybe people have tried to unveil the natural uh, structure of some um, probabilistic manifolds and, and things like that. And some other people yet are working on topology and, and questions like that. So, so what type of, of mathematics do you consider essential here or is it gonna be a mix of all of them? Yeah, uh, basically because ge ge geometric deep learning this paradigm is very broad indeed. Uh, it considers structures that are, even if you think of it, uh, mathematicians that work on graphs and manifolds are usually don't even sit on the same floor in the math department, right? And they don't talk to each other, they don't drink coffee to each other. It's, it's, very, it's very different. But uh, the, the underlying principle is, of course, the model of symmetry through uh, the, the concepts of group theory. Now, when you come to implement the particular symmetry uh, on the graph, it will be very different. It will be discrete, it will be something that looks like permutation. On the manifold, it will be completely different. You will need to define parallel transport, and this uh, requires uh, some, some calculus, some, some uh, differential um, structures. But uh, basically, from 30,000 feet uh, perspective, uh, they are all the same from this lens. So it's uh, uh, basically it depends on the level of resolution. Uh, if you want really to do things, then you need to understand, of course, the, the, the 
bread and butter of the specific domains or specific structures that, that you work with. Maybe one question in relation to these and, and how to apply uh, you know, topics from different contexts. Uh, here, Jan Gerken asks, if you could give an example where gauge invariance is essential, that is uh, where we need to consider different gauges and it's not enough to fix a gauge for all data points. So I would say that uh, uh, manifolds or uh, well uh, surfaces uh, probably a good example. So in that case, uh, basically the bundle that you consider is uh, the, the tangent bundle, and um, you want your filters to be uh, to, to be gauge equivalent. So the, uh, maybe I, I rushed a little bit through this explanation in the talk, but the fact is that uh, when we have vectors, tangent vectors on the manifold, so they are uh, abstract geometric entities. So they are not. I think one of the crimes against humanity that is committed in uh, basic courses is to tell that a vector is an arrow or an array of coordinates. So not, none of this is true, technically speaking, because uh, to, uh, to, to think of a vector as an arrow, you need to define it in inner product that allows you to measure directions. And to think of uh, a vector as a, an array of coordinates, you need to define a frame system of coordinates. So uh, basically, the, uh, all the, the, the beauty and the difficulty of differential geometry is to, to work to, to define uh, structures in a coordinate-free manner. Now, when you want to, to work with uh, vectors on a computer, you must, of course, represent them as numbers. And here comes the choice of uh, the, the reference frame. And the, uh, the, the, the disappointing or the complicating thing uh, on the manifold is that it is defined in a completely arbitrary way. Now, uh, that's why uh, you need a gauge equivariance, because uh, you want your structures to transform in the same way uh, when you transform the frame. So here I should say that theory departs from practice because even though you don't have a canonical way of defining a frame on manifold, in practice you can define uh, frames on manifolds that are stable under near isometric deformations. So there are many works, well, we also even had uh, last year or two years ago in CPR a paper that it was called G-frames. So maybe they have some singularities, maybe they're not uh, completely uh, uniquely defined when you have flat uh, regions, but Overall, you can just do this hack of fixing the frame and then uh, the situation becomes much simpler. But to make it mathematically correct, you need gauge uh, equivariance. Mm -hmm. uh, now, since we are going into a little bit more technical questions, uh, maybe I can uh, read here um, well, questions in relation to rewiring. So Katya Hoffman asks, um, what would be an example or an application of rewiring? And then also, we have um, Abhai Singh who asks, uh, what are your thoughts on edge, edge rewiring methods in GNNs? Is it reasonable to lose the original structure of the graph given that we believe structure is what GNNs are learning in the first place? Yeah, so this is a complex question. And I don't think that I have a complete answer. So it probably depends a lot on the problem and uh, on the uh, type of structure, in particular, whether your graph uh, uh, is of homophilic nature or not. Basically, uh, if uh, your neighbors are similar to you, roughly, that's uh, what we, we define this homophily. Now, I should say that de facto, uh, many of the uh, graph neural networks do not stick to the input graph uh, to do message passing. So probably the, the, the first example that uh, was driven by considerations of scalability is, uh, the, the, uh, is the graph sage architecture, where they use graph sampling. So it's not the same graph that, that on which you, you do message passing. Uh, recent works, for example, Stefan Gunemann with his Deagle diffusion improves uh, graph learning. So they uh, use personalized page rank to rewire the graph. So they are uh, basically give an argument of graph denoising. They show that it works better than the, the original graph. And uh, many other things. Well, uh, for example, you can use multi crop filters. So essentially, it's like if you wired your node to all the, the two or three or four crop neighbors. So we, we did these kind of filters well. Uh, higher order networks uh, like uh, the work that we did together you can think of it in a sense also not sticking to the original graph but maybe augmenting it with with uh, uh, higher order uh, higher order structures so there are issues um, on the more theoretical uh, level like uh, like bottlenecks so if uh, your graph happens to be of uh, of uh, a nature where the number of neighbors grows exponentially as you go to more distant nodes and your problem also depends on long distance info then you get this bottleneck phenomenon that you need to squeeze uh, a lot of feature vectors into a single vector and therefore rewiring the graph to remove these bottlenecks seems to be important. So that was a paper of Uri Alon from last year and they show that even using at some point a, a, a complete graph, a fully connected graph with maybe learnable 
uh, weights with uh, with attention mechanism actually improves the results. So uh, I think bottom line, uh, it is not fully understood when it, it is needed, when it helps, but uh, I think uh, it is completely not a sacrosanct structure. And maybe also in relation to uh, practical aspects, we have a question here by Sardi Matt who asks, uh, maybe it's a basic result, but um, I was wondering, is forcing a neural network to learn shift invariance by adding an extra regularization term to the cost function, is it equivalent to having a convolutional neural network or at least equivalent in the limit? I don't think it's equivalent uh, because in convolutional neural network, well, so we don't really consider the, the, uh, the effect of uh, optimization and uh, different regularization technique, which is, which is uh, 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 I would say an orthogonal story, but uh, it is also important. So convolutional neural networks are, uh, you can also show that they're universal approximators, but uh, uh, the universal approximator for, uh, uh, for a particular class of functions, right? for, for example, uh, uh, shift equivariant functions. Adding regularization in your architecture, you will still probably be, uh, um, uh, basically it will be a fully connected network, right? So it will have a lot of weights, but you will be somehow making this, uh, uh, weights dependent or redundant. Uh, it is probably a possible solution. Uh, you can also do, for example, data augmentation. That's what is co co commonly done. But I, I, I would argue that basically, if you know the kind of symmetry in your problem, uh, you better build it into the architecture. Now, maybe an important part of this story, though, that uh, exact symmetries are uh, probably too much of an abstraction. And uh, you, can, you can say that, OK, in images, we don't really have shifts. What about? approximate deformation. So this is what Joan Bruna showed in, in his uh, already classical paper with Stefan Mala is showing that uh, you can also allow uh, something that is sufficiently close to the exact symmetry. So if you think of, for example, uh, smooth deformation, it's not exactly a group, right? Because uh, a deformation, uh, if you compose two deformations, they will not be of the same class, right? So for the book of, I don't know, a C. Lipschitz uh, 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 deformation, then uh, their composition will not be. I will not be uh, selected, but uh, uh, but uh, you can still show that in this case you have uh, a relaxed version of approximate invariance and equivariance, and this will, uh, this is really what makes convolutional neural networks, for example, so powerful that they are stable under such um, uh, under such approximate uh, symmetries as well. And this principle applies to uh, uh, to, uh, to to other uh, instances of geometric deep learning. So we can talk about approximate uh, invariance rather than exact invariance. Okay, um, so uh, let me move on to uh, topics related to applications. You mentioned in your talk that this is uh, the one thing that you're most excited about, uh, applications um, of uh, geometric deep learning. And um, so we have a question here from Katja Hoffman, who is curious about the application of graph learning to detect misinformation networks. Do you see a danger? of an arms race where these tools could also be used to make misinformation seem to spread naturally, avoiding detection? Do you see any ways to counter this? Yeah, it's a good question. So, uh, well, I, I would say it is it is an arms race in any way. And uh, uh, basically graph-based signal is one of the signals. Of course, there are many. So uh, of course, uh, probably attackers can become more sophisticated and try to overcome it. I, I would argue that probably uh, at least at a high level, uh, faking or manipulating a network behavior is more difficult because you need somehow to uh, basically you're a single attacker or maybe multiple attackers you, you cannot really uh, change the way that the entire network works uh, having said that there are of course works uh, from the same Stefan Gudeman for example on adversarial attacks on graph neural networks where you have a certain budget of how many nodes or how many edges you can change to, to basically to make uh, your graph neural network classifier uh, to make our own prediction. So yeah, I think bottom line, no clear answer and uh, it's a, it is indeed an arm trace. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what, what are other applications that, of course you mentioned that you talked already, uh, you know, a number of very, very exciting applications, but you know, what are some applications that you would like to highlight or where you think uh, there is gonna be most potential for geometric deep learning in the next couple of years? Yeah, so I would say, well, I, I said biology is probably something that that uh, that excites me a lot. So I think at the level of problems where you have a very clear physical models, like modeling molecules, I think it uh, already shines. So uh, virtual in silico screening of drugs. Uh, at the level of biology, basically, when we have networks of interactions, 
this is something that these networks are uh, probably throw away some information or maybe a lot of information. So uh, choosing the right level of abstraction is important. I should say now, uh, basically, in addition to, to, the, to, the, to the, these new machine learning techniques, we also have uh, new um, experimental techniques available, like uh, the program of CRISPR knockouts that allow you to disable some of the genes in the cell and see how, basically, uh, what is the response, right? So basically, how this thing works. So you get, uh, you, you can also measure some some phenotype features, and uh, this is very exciting because this was not available maybe just a few years ago. So it's uh, basically uh, the technology that allows uh, high throughput data collection, collection of the right data that is useful for machine learning, combined with machine learning algorithms, uh, that potentially makes it very powerful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, okay, so since we are on this topic, maybe I can ask you. Uh, what, what do you see, uh, you know, as, 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 as the important challenges in, in moving towards those applications? Uh, so what, what kind of problems um, would we need to solve uh, towards getting there? So maybe both at the practical level and at the more theoretical level. Yeah, so I think uh, probably one of the, at least for me, one of the challenges when uh, trying to work with uh, applications like again, biology is really the, the domain expertise. So it's very uh, rarely that uh, something off the shelf would work. You really need to understand the problem and make your uh, machine learning uh, system designed in a way, in a particular way that, that uh, understands and take into, it takes into account the, the, the specific uh, aspects of the problem. Uh, you need to understand what is the data, what are the, the results. So I think in this domain, it's really uh, good to collaborate with people who have the, the, the deep understanding of the, of the problems. And also one, one additional thing is that, of course, uh, in computer science, uh, probably for us, most of the things end when we get some numbers, right? We get some performance and uh, here it is. And you see a lot of uh, uh, biological applications of, of machine learning that end uh, basically at simulated results. But that's for most of the biologists or clinicians, that's where uh, the story uh, only starts. And basically making this step from uh, computational results to something that, that uh, would uh, pass the bar of convincing uh, the experts in the domain is, is probably at least 80% or maybe 90% of the work that can take uh, a lot of time. And for computer scientists, it's very frustrating because uh, well, in simulation, it can take you a few weeks or maybe a few months to do something. Uh, in a wet lab, it can take a year. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that's really the gap also in expectations and in understanding uh, these sort of problems. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the collaboration is a, is an important part. Uh, as I take from from your response, that's uh, you know that's an important note to to take. And now, in terms of the theoretical aspects or the mathematical challenge, what would you you know consider an interesting or let's say you know for a young PhD student, uh, what type of you know problem should that person maybe you know be considering as something that would be really exciting um, to try to to solve. Um, yeah, so uh, I think there are many directions. So one that is uh, very exciting. So I mentioned it in uh, uh, also in the talk. So this uh, uh, um, uh, the graph neural networks with uh, latent graph inference. So it uh, it is a much deeper and broader field. So uh, uh, Petra Velishko, uh, my uh, uh, collaborator on the book, uh, likes uh, to think of it in terms of algorithmic reasoning. And uh, basically, we, we have a lot of uh, classical problems in graph theory, right? For which we know that uh, it, even the complexity class is, is very problematic. We have uh, NP hard problems like, like traveling salesmen or quadratic assignment. We have some algorithms that, that try to deal uh, maybe uh, heuristically with these problems. So uh, we can say a lot about these algorithms. On the other hand, we have neural networks, right? Like graph neural networks, which we, uh, about which we cannot say much right so it's very difficult to understand how and why they work so basically to interpret the results and, and, and guarantee a certain performance uh, we know that they uh, have certain generalization on, on uh, different data sets uh, algorithms have perfect generalization right you can apply an algorithm that, that addresses a certain task on any kind of data but neural networks are much better in generalizing across tasks so this is probably very uh, common in computer vision that you train your convolutional neural network on ImageNet, and then you can apply, for example, to do tumor detection. I think even the ImageNet trained network was used to, to do this reconstruction of the black hole event horizon. Uh, this is from what I read. Maybe, maybe it was well, slightly fine-tuned. 
uh, this is uh, this doesn't happen with algorithms, right? So if you have an algorithm to measure the shortest path on a graph, it will not work for another task. Simply not designed for it. So this combination of the of the two things, right? Thinking of algorithms that maybe have some learnable parts or vice versa, thinking of neural networks as approximation of algorithms, I think it's a very powerful concept. And uh, uh, I should mention uh, one cool uh, paper from last year that excited me. This was from Kyle Kramer from NYU. So they uh, used a, a graph neural network to model a, a multi-particle system. So it's a physical system where you have multiple uh, things that interact. So they uh, learn generic uh, message passing functions to describe their interactions. And then they request symbolic equations. So basically, you get equations of motion from uh, a, a generic uh, observation of the system. Not only that it generalizes better, of course, but it basically it allows you to learn the, the laws of motion of a system. So something that, if you think of it, 500 years ago, it took Kepler 20 years pouring over data to derive the equation of motion of the planets. Nowadays, you can do it in, uh, in a few seconds with uh, such a neural network and get basically a closed form expression. So I think this is very cool. And, yeah, that's uh, truly the spirit of data science. Yeah. It is well, but this is, I think, this is a little bit departing from the spirit of at least uh, deep learning because uh, uh, it makes it more interpretable. And maybe if I'm thinking of this argument between uh, uh, symbolic and, and connectionist uh, approaches, right? Let's say that they are between Gary Marcus and Joshua Benjo, maybe it's a way to reconcile between these uh, viewpoints. Hmm. Unfortunately, we're running kind of short on time, but there are at least two questions that I, I, I cannot not ask them. So I, I, I should uh, for sure. So one of them um, is uh, um, here. Oh, I lost the, the question that the person was asking. But the question is, um, how do you actually manage uh, to combine all this entrepreneurship and your research, um, you know, and your collaborations? Um, it seems like you know it's a lot of uh, time commitment. How, how do you manage to do that? That's the one question. And the other question, uh, I'm going to get to that in a second. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So well, I don't think I unfortunately I have an answer. So uh, I think uh, my failure rate in terms of ideas that that uh, uh, seem to be promising and then uh, don't work is pretty high. I would say probably <laughs> certainly higher than fifty percent. So I think it's it's uh, uh, trying to understand uh, what matters at what. Uh, time point and cutting things that that, that 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 don't work or basically prioritizing. I'm not sure that I'm good at it at all. So some things uh, just work by magic because it's a lucky circumstance. So in my also in my entrepreneurial uh, experience, uh, I also learned probably that being uh, right but in the wrong time or in the wrong place uh, doesn't help. So uh, basically, my first startup, we tried to do uh, what then became a, into a real sense, and it was uh, too premature. So probably being uh, too early of the market is not uh, is not uh, is not good, right? So having a technology that that is uh, uh, that is promising but but doesn't come at the right moment of time. Okay, I want to thank everyone who has been asking the questions. Um, we have too many questions, too many interested people. Um, we cannot cover all of them here. Uh, so, but you know, one of the things that you know has come up and that, that you have mentioned, uh, you, you are preparing a book on geometric deep learning. Um, and maybe you, you want to advertise that a little bit or tell us a little bit about uh, the highlights of that book. Uh, I, I know that that could be a, a very useful resource to many, many of the people um, here at the session. Yeah, so basically this is a, a, a long collaboration with uh, Joan Bruna from NYU, uh, Taco Coin from Qualcomm and Petr Vyshkovich from DeepMind. So basically we uh, published a few days ago last week uh, what we call a proto book. It's not yet a book, but it's already 150 pages uh, article. So uh, it uh, basically tries to, to derive uh, uh, deep representation learning architectures from first principles. So what I uh, basically highlighted in my talk, but of course going into much more, more details. And um, I think, as I said, I think deep learning is a, a fantastic technology and uh, extremely powerful. It's really changing some, some fields. What I find personally is that it has a lot of uh, empirical stuff to it. So it's uh, difficult to see relations between different methods. And maybe even uh, in, in our approach, maybe we are uh, missing many relations. So here we try to basically to formulate some underlying principle and uh, show how it comes up uh, many times in different architectures. So in graph neural networks, for example, you can derive an architecture from the uh, basic principle or basic structure, the symmetry of graphs, right? Which is permutation invariance. 
uh, in convolutional neural networks that you can derive them from shifts. So the convolution itself, you can actually show that if you start with a basic translational the principle of translational symmetry, basically everything comes up magically as a result. So it's not just some arbitrary formula, some definition that somebody gave you. This, this is what when I was studying signal processing, I was always uh, somehow dissatisfied with this definition. What, why this convolution? Why not something else? So now I think with this approach, you can understand uh, uh, why it is. And it's not that, so it's nothing new about it because people are working on representation theory, of course, have been studying this for 100 years, but somehow presenting it in a coherent way for a machine learning uh, audience and say that basically what you've been doing is an instance of a bigger picture. I think this is, uh, at least pedagogically, in my opinion, is very powerful. And uh, probably, well, I, we, I, I like uh, quoting uh, Elvetius, uh, who said that, that understanding of certain principles surpasses the need to, to understand certain facts. I think that's exactly the instance of this powerful uh, mindset. Thank you so much, uh, Michael, um, for uh, discussing uh, with us, for uh, taking the time here during the Q&A. Uh, I know the time is very limited, uh, so uh, I hope that uh, all the people who have been posting their questions on the chat uh, uh, stay tuned. And um, hopefully, Michael, will have uh, the time to, to return to some of those questions um, after the session. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for participating. And, and particularly, especially, thank you, uh, Michael, uh, for your presentation and, and these insights into geometric deep learning. So, Thanks, Peter everyone for listening.